Today, we are actually really excited because we have a, an amazing guest. It's actually a, um, a family member of Steele's. Yeah, so James is my nephew, and uh, he was down here, so I figured, hey, you know. I know uh, James was mentioning a little bit about that uh, in regards to uh, people with rough upbringings or who have been uh, adopted, have uh, come to be very smart. I guess I've noticed it because like uh, I was talking to Steele about it and uh, we, like we talked about it and we're like me and Steele kind of have similar upbringings and that where our lives are pretty rough and that we both seem to be pretty intelligent. You mentioned uh, a philosopher or was it an inventor that had a similar like situation? Yeah. Polymath. Yeah, exactly. Polymath. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci. He yeah. was adopted. Yeah, he was adopted. And then also, we talked about Steve Jobs, how Steve Jobs was adopted and became really su successful. There's something said about Steve Jobs. It was in the movie, and it's kind of like this theory that's kind of interesting. Like, well, maybe Steve Jobs wanted to prove his, his biological parents wrong by working his hardest in life. Mm. And so that's why it was so successful, yeah. because unconsciously, when a child is adopted or their birth parents reject them, even if they didn't witness it, there might be this unconscious belief formed in their brain that they weren't wanted they weren't loved that they have to prove something and so what do you do if you, you don't feel like you're loved by the people who gave birth to you then you try to prove prove something to, to the world, the world. Yeah. Yes. and it seems like uh, like whenever you're going up kind of rough you might not be as socially inept as a bunch of other kids so you could be put down and kind of bullied and maybe that's yeah. like another thing that pushes you to like try to prove people that you can be something Bit. I mean, I, I went through some bullying myself and, and I feel like it did kind of lead to that, you know, like trying to prove something to those. What if social social um, isolation leads to like leads to higher intelligence, maybe? Yeah, because what are you doing when you're alone? You're focusing more on just things. thinking about your like own thoughts and like, you know, like a yeah. lot of the times I don't really have anybody to talk to. So I'm just in my room thinking about things, you know, that allows you to connect to maybe what some people might say, you know, a higher intelligence or you know, um, just the thoughts that, that, that are coming through our mind and it gives you, gives us an opportunity to actually create and, and to actually formulate thoughts, ask questions, right? Because I, I always find it very fascinating that people haven't asked themselves big questions like the meaning of life. And, and I think that's why I'm so grateful that I've studied a little bit of philosophy in school. And because I think that opened my perspective to say like, whoa, this is actually what might be necessary for human development. The thing I learned in grad school with advanced research methods is you got to be careful with these articles because they'll take things out of proportion and they're not adept at fully reading the scientific article at its roots and really fully. And sometimes they'll exaggerate things. So I would just take it with a grain of salt. But at the same time, it is interesting that adopted siblings compared to other siblings had an IQ score 4.4 points higher. Uh, famous people who are adopted. Uh, Babe Ruth, Eleanor Roosevelt, Steve Jobs, Melissa Gilbert. I don't know that. I don't know all these people. Elon Musk. That's so interesting because even even myself, like like my parents having come from Mexico and and I'm trying like I'm the oldest of the family. And it's almost like that internal pressure of like, hey, you have to almost do your best to to like make your parents efforts like fruitful kind of deal, you know, and and it's almost like that internal, like, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to show them off. Like I'm going to be the best. Yeah, And I think Socrates was battling with this idea that no one can possibly know everything. And he was mm. claim, making the claim, something like wisdom is being able to admit what you don't know, being able to admit that you don't know something that's humility. I think we talked about this too, James, like, uh, people, often people who are not intelligent think they're intelligent and then they make boastful claims that are not true. Yes, we yeah. were talking about that. I think there's actually this real thing. Hold on. Yes, the Dunning-Kruger effect. The Dunning-Kruger. Oh, okay. Kruger. Like if you don't have a high intelligence, you, it can turn into arrogance to, to you know, I think arrogance. Yeah to, yeah, to substitute for for the gap, right? Something like that, yeah. Maybe, yeah, yeah something like that. Yeah, so it's comp I'm sure it's more complicated. But or maybe if you have a lower intelligence, you kind of oversimplify the world. And like I've noticed that people who are intelligence often like struggle with like, you know, like understanding the meaning of life. And yeah, they see like an no. over complexity of how the earth works and they know how it really works. And people with lower intelligence, they see earth through very simplified eyes. 
You know what I'm yeah. saying? So they mm-hmm. might think they know about everything because they don't know what the earth has to offer. When I was a kid growing up, young, like 11 or 12, I would constantly have existential crisis. Like, every, like I would have problems in school because of it. Like, what's the point of even working? What's the point of mm. doing my work if we're all just going to die anyway? I've done that a lot too. Like, and I think it's just the higher intelligence makes you overthink reality. Yes. Overthinking existence. Well, what is the point really? Because then it gets so complicated and I feel like most people don't really think about that stuff as much. For me, I don't believe there truly is a point of life. I just found a way to sort of find peace with that and just acknowledge like, okay, I'm going to die one day, but I guess since I'm here, I might as well just do something. Like people who, who've had the highest like IQs, like I think the that the man who has like the highest IQ right now is like 300. I mean, you, you had told me, right? Yeah, it was 200. 200? 200? Yeah. yeah, that's still a lot. <laughs> that's still a lot. Yes. And, and so... He even him, he works as I think a janitor or something like yeah, that. Works because as a, people he couldn't works as a bouncer, yeah. Yeah, he, he couldn't yeah, socialize right. with people because he was just so smart that people couldn't relate to him. And what that ended up doing is that that he he's just like isolated to himself. And I think he we talked he, about that too, still. Even him yeah, we did has come up with the idea of like a god. And so yeah, yeah, and yeah. so I think that that is so interesting talking about purpose and IQ. Oh, yeah. Christopher Langan is he just to add more to what you were saying was they just to give more context yeah. he was at a university and he was so intelligent that he was smarter than all the professors there so he felt like he wasn't getting any benefit by going to the university so he just decided to drop out and become a bouncer because maybe I don't know why maybe he wanted a simpler lifestyle who knows what it was and he just lives on a simple ranch and he works on his own scientific theories at his ranch and he's published them online. And his main theory is like the idea of God being connected with the whole universe and stuff like that. And Do you ever have moments where like, like this coincidence is that just like, it's insane. Like how, like, uh, like things that like happen that shouldn't happen. Like you'll see numbers that match up and stuff. Or like, th- like if you meet somebody like later, like later on and then they, you talk to them and like you say like, oh, I've been at this place at a certain time. And like, it turns out you've like seen each other before, but like didn't notice it. Just like crazy coincidences like that kind of make me believe in religion. I try to look at every single side of the argument. So this is one that the brain is making an illusion in our brain. Like when we have deja vu, it's, it's some type of malfunction in our brain and misperceiving. I think there's something like misperceiving time. Like our time perception is off by like mm. a millisecond and we miss our brain interprets that as there. It's really complicated. Something like that. Yeah. When we see things in hindsight, then we're more likely to see coincidences. But we're in the moment of what we thought was, in hindsight, a coincidence. When we're in the moment, we don't think of it as a coincidence. It's only after in hindsight. And so then psychology argues that that's a bias and that it could be ourselves just tricking ourselves into wanting to believe that. I'm always thinking about all the sides all the time. So like sometimes I do fall into that existential crisis of like, well, that could maybe this is all an illusion, like all these things. But then if you believe in existentialism, if you go to the nihilist route, then at the very least, you still have the belief that you, we create our own meaning. Even if there is no meaning in the universe, then that just means we create our own. And then we follow that. So many things. Like, you know, how ants, I wonder if ants think they do like they have free will. Yeah, that's mm. a, I wish we could talk. Oh, we, we talked a lot. And that the thing way. is, another thing is that like, animals might have their own language, right? Ants have their own language. They communicate. Dolphins do. Dolphins have their own language. Mm. They have different dialects. Like well, whales and stuff, they have different accents and stuff. That's wow. crazy, man. And another thing is with, uh, with memories, we can have false memories implanted without even realizing it. There's yes. an experiment done with hot air balloons, and they made people believe that they went on a vacation in their childhood on a hot air balloon. And the people actually believe that they had that they had done that even though they never had and they they implanted a false memory and then they started coming up with more details that weren't even told to them by the experimenter and so that false memory was planted and then new memories grew around it our emotions yeah, now actually affect the way we interpret our past memories if i feel sad now and depressed i'm more likely to remember all the negative things that happened to me and even interpret the positive things that happened to me in the past negatively so even like our memories can change with interpretation and stuff like that all the time. So it does make you question consciousness and reality. Uh, There's two colonies of separate species of ants and they were like lined up in a border. Like the soldiers were lined up and they, and like one of them was guarding their territory and the other one was guarding their territory. And it was like, they were in a stalemate. They were just defending their areas, but they were in peace. 
they weren't like battling or anything. They were just standing guard there. Like you ever pay attention to ants? I used to study them all the They're time. They're a lot like humans, right? When I was in like elementary school on the playground, I would just watch the ants, what they were doing a lot of the time. I would just study them. We don't stop and think about this, but it's amazing how these are creatures that are tiny compared to us. And they line up, they go in like a single file line. They collect pieces of dirt one at a time, bring it back. They dig up and they make these intricate tunnels underground. And then they put the dirt up on a hill and build intricate tunnels in there. That's kind of complicated if you think about it. You know, they also have graves. They have like, they know that like they need to bring their dead to a certain area or else disease will spread. They emit a certain chemical and they say, hey, this person, this, this ant is dead. We need to bring him to the graveyard because they somehow they understand that if you, if you just have dead laying around, it will spread disease. They're born knowing that and humans have to learn that. Ants have pheromones and unique body language to communicate, like raising their abdomen, uh, making noises to communicate. So, I mean, it's kind of interesting. Like, it's Yeah. And, and it's so interesting that these are animals that have survived and can survive many like natural disasters. 